Hello, my name is Herbert and welcome to my complete beginner's guide to Linux. In this guide, I will take you from zero to hero, explaining you the most essential Linux concepts that will help you navigate your way through Linux. But first of all, what is Linux anyway? Whether you work in IT or not, you are working with Linux right now. That device you are watching this video on right now uses Linux in some way. But what exactly is Linux and what does it do? First of all, what is an operating system? The very basic definition of an operating system is that it is the layer between your hardware and software. It allows your hardware and software to talk to each other. The operating system does things like manage memory, hard disks, and all of that important stuff. It also makes your mouse cursor move when you are moving your mouse, for example. It can also do much more other things like host services that can run things like websites. If you have a computer without an operating system, you are pretty much screwed. So Linux is an operating system. Hmm, not really. It's kind of referred to as an operating system, but in actuality, it is a kernel. A kernel is the heart and soul of an operating system that runs the most low-level tasks of the operating system. See, Linux is a term that is used to describe the operating system that uses the Linux kernel. In 1991, a guy from Finland named Linus Torvalds created a kernel that would be a free and open source alternative to the then popular Unix. Linux actually stands for Linux is not Unix. But having just a kernel was not going to get him very far. An operating system needs a whole set of extra features to actually run on a computer or server. This is where Richard Stallman and his team found out about Torvald's work and asked him kindly if they could use his kernel as an addition to their operating system called GNU. To which he replied, of course, yes. The GNU slash Linux operating system was born, but people just refer to it as Linux nowadays. Stallman is still not very happy about this. After all, who wouldn't be? A lot of the tools used in Linux are made by Stallman and his GNU team. Both Torvalds and Stallman were great proponents of a free and open source model. This is the reason why there are so many Linux distributions out there. People could freely download the code and modify it to their desires to create their own projects. What we see now is that most of these Linux distributions share the same free and open source model for their operating system, like for example Debian and Arch Linux, though some are not free as in free of charge. Distributions like Red Hat require paid licenses to get updates and support. But in this course, we are not focusing on Red Hat type distributions. We are going to focus on Debian type distributions, more specific Ubuntu. Ubuntu is one of the most popular Linux distributions out there, so it should be no surprise we choose this one for our guide. Other distributions are pretty similar, but they will differ in things such as packet managers and service managers. And we'll get into that what those are later in the course. But enough talking for now, let's actually start with the course. So like we said in the previous video, uh, Ubuntu will be the Linux distribution of our choice. So why Ubuntu? Well, Ubuntu is one of the most used operating systems out there in the Linux space. Uh, there's others like CentOS and Red Hat, but Ubuntu is by far the most used out there. Also, Microsoft recently implemented something called WSL, which stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux, which uses Ubuntu as its underlying technology. So it should come to no surprise that we're choosing Ubuntu because this seems to be sort of the, the industry's standard when it comes to Linux. Now we're going to be learning about the Ubuntu desktop in this course, but we're not going to be dabbling around with the desktop too much because we're going to go into the uh, terminal very quickly. We're just going to go over a little bit of setup just to get to know the desktop environment a little bit. Uh, but the desktop environment is not really where the power of Linux lies. It's very handy to have such a thing to be able to navigate yourself in a graphical way through your operating system. But the main focus of Linux is the terminal, and that's what we're going to be focusing 
focusing on. So let's just download Ubuntu and let's go over to the website ubuntu.com and you can click on download and you can click on Ubuntu desktop and you can download the 20.04 LTS. If, however, you're watching this video later in the future, you can download whatever the latest version is. But I would suggest you go with the LTS, which stands for Long Term Support, because this is going to give you the most stability. These are the most tested versions. So we're going to download this one over here. We're now on version 20.04. Again, if you are watching this later in the future, it should be no issue because most of the commands that I am going to be using are commands that have been around for years and they are not going to change anytime soon. The next tool that we're going to be downloading is Rufus and Rufus is actually a tool that makes bootable USB drives. So we're going to be downloading it from rufus.ie and we're also going to be downloading the latest version which is 3.13 at the time of this video. But again, if you have a later version, that's fine. Just download the later version. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a USB drive that contains the Ubuntu operating system. And this will allow us to install Ubuntu on our PC. Now, fair warning for people installing this with a USB drive. If you are installing this on your hard drive, uh, chances are that you're going to lose all your data. So before you install Ubuntu on your PC, make sure that you have a backup of all your documents. So for installing Ubuntu, there are two options. You can either go, well, actually there's three. You can actually go with a complete installation of Ubuntu, which is the most recommended which means that everything on, com on your computer is just gone and you only have Ubuntu. You can also go with something called a dual boot installation and a dual boot will have you uh, boot between, you can choose whenever your computer boots, you can choose between either your main operating system, which is either Ubuntu or Windows or the other one. So you can choose between Windows and Ubuntu. And if you are, if you're on a Mac, you can do the same thing, right? You can use a Mac to boot into uh into the Mac OS, or you can boot into the Ubuntu operating system. And also, if you're if you don't want to do any of this, a third solution is installing VirtualBox. VirtualBox will allow you to install a virtualized environment, which is actually just a computer that runs on top of your computer. So you can actually virtualize a computer, and you can actually run Ubuntu within that computer. Now, do take note that performance is pretty dramatic in a virtual machine like VirtualBox. Uh, you'll see that mouse cursors are moving a lot slower. The, sh the system itself is pretty slow. Uh, so in general, you know, you're not going to get the complete experience of a Ubuntu machine. And even better, if you are ready to take the next step, you can actually just remove every other operating system on your computer and just use Ubuntu. And the reason why I prefer this is because it just gives you this emergency scenario. You have to find solutions to every single thing you encounter. Of course, you are going to find problems with your computer. You're going to find issues with installing software. You're going to find issues with configuring Ubuntu. But this is what learning Linux is all about. It's about get, getting into trouble and fixing that trouble. That's what, you know, it's generally learning how to work with an operating system is all about. And that's how I learned it. I just went with a complete empty Linux installation and I was like, let's just go. Let's just try this. Let's just see where it brings me. And this is where I learned the most because it really brought me into this scenario where I really had to go and learn more and go and find things on YouTube, go and find things on Google and go and find things on Stack Overflow. And that's where you really start learning Linux. But again, you have to start somewhere and this guide will definitely help you on the way to learning the basics of Linux and learning to actually know where to go and look. So now let's actually run Rufus over here. So you can go ahead and run Rufus. You want to, uh, you want to allow Rufus to check for applications. We're going to click no because we just downloaded the latest version. Let's insert our USB drive here and we should see it pop up over here. And now we're going to select the ISO. So you can go ahead and click select. Now let's select the ISO we just downloaded. So we're going to click this one over here and let's just go ahead and click start. And now we, and we click okay now. 
and there it has started and you know we're just gonna let this finish and once that's finished we're gonna reboot our system and we're gonna insert our usb drive and boot off of the usb drive now of course booting your computer off of a usb stick is an individual process for each computer so most likely you're going to go into your BIOS and change the boot order to have the USB stick as the first boot device. And then it should automatically boot into this. And this is actually the language selection menu. So choose whatever language you want. But I would suggest you just go with English. This is going to make it a lot easier to follow along with the tutorial. So we're going to go for English over here. And you can actually try Ubuntu without installing it. Uh, but we're actually going to install it right away. Uh, we're going to see how Ubuntu to looks in just a second when we actually get to the desktop so we're going to go ahead and install ubuntu over here so this would give you a little bit of a glimpse of how ubuntu actually looks like so this is sort of the interface you'll get on the desktop so we're just going to click english we're going to click continue over here we're just going to click choose our keyboard layout over here click continue and we're going to go with the normal installation. So over here you can choose erase disk and install Ubuntu. So there's also going to be an option where you can actually choose to install Ubuntu next to an existing operating system. If you want to experiment with that, go ahead. This should give you the dual boot installation we talked about. Uh, but this is just going to be a complete reinstallation, a, a completely clean installation of Ubuntu, where you only have Ubuntu as your main operating system. Now we're going to type in our name over here. So I'm going to type in my name and then we can choose a password. Make sure it's a strong password, of course. And now we are actually installing Ubuntu. So the installation is complete. We can click restart now. Be sure to plug out your USB drive when restarting the system. Now I'm going to do a little bit of terminal trickery here, uh, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but it's just because I'm recording this actually, uh, because of technical reasons, I am recording this video on a virtual machine. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of trickery in the terminal to make this screen a little bit bigger in order so you guys can actually watch this video in full screen. Uh, that's why the screen was so small during the setup of this video, just because of technical reasons. I'm recording this on a virtual machine and when you're installing on a virtual machine, it gets a small screen and you have to make it bigger using some terminal command. Anyways, uh, like I said, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but I'm going to do that right now. So here we are again in our full screen desktop. This time I made the tweak so you guys can follow along on the full screen. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to stop this section. And we're going to move on to the next section where we're going to talk about more of desktop tweaks and stuff like that. And after that, we're going to dive straight into the console. So now that we're all set up, we can start configuring Ubuntu to whatever we want it to be. So by default, Ubuntu comes with a few things installed. So we have a web browser, which is Mozilla Firefox by default. Which we have an email client, which is Thunderbird Mail. We have Rhythmbox, which is a audio player. And then we have LibreOffice Writer, which is actually a word uh, replacer. And then we have the Ubuntu Software Center. Now let's dive into the Ubuntu Software Center for just a second here. So we do have some um, applications that we can install from this menu. So we can install things like Blender, uh, AlphaCast. But these are, of course, the things that are our editor's picks. But down, uh, down here, we can actually find other things. So we can find, for example, we can pick news and weather. And here are some news applications. But um, most likely, we don't want to use the software center too much. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because, you know, not all the software that's for the that's made for Ubuntu is on the software center. So let's just close the software center for now. And let's actually try to download something from the internet. So let's go onto our Mozilla Firefox web browser and let's just say we want to install Google Chrome. So we can actually go over to googlechrome.com. So google.com slash Chrome and we can download Chrome over here and we'll select the dot uh, package, which is the correct package for uh, Debian and Ubuntu. So accept and install and let's save the file. And once that is downloaded, we can find that over here and we can run it immediately. And now the software center will open and we can actually click install here and it will ask us for a password. There we go. Now it's installing and we're 
done here so now uh of course where can we find this well the best way to find these things is either by clicking show applications and you can actually uh click on frequent or on all so we can click on all and right over here we can find google chrome now also what we can do is we can just type in chrome at type to search here so if we type in CR, uh, CHR, we'll find Google Chrome over here. So this is the search bar. If you're looking for something that you can't find, you can find it very easily. You can either go through this uh, menu over here so we can either show applications or we can also go over here into, into activities and then we can type in Chrome as well and we'll find it as well. So notice what happened here. So I clicked activities and right away we can see two windows opened so we can see google chrome is open over here and over here we have uh mozilla firefox opened so this is actually also how you can switch between tabs so we can do alt tab to switch between uh two windows and we can or we can click activities to see them to see them both active at the same time and then we can just click the one that we want to use so we can click on google chrome and there we are this is google chrome and it's working perfectly so we can actually just close this up let's close this up as well uh, next up i want to show you a little bit about the explorer window so this is actually the file explorer uh, what you can find over here are your documents your desktop folder your downloads music pictures it's pretty much the same as in windows or mac well, we're going to be diving into how to view your folders and files later on in the course using the terminal which is actually the right way to do it in linux but just for you know if you're actually using if you're actually using this on your desktop pc and you're actually using this as your main operating system it's you know it's of course going to be much handier to use this instead on the top right corner over here we can see a few things we can see that our connection is wired and that we're connected and over here we can see settings and we are not going to be dabbling too much in the settings. These are all most likely going to be personal preferences. So there are things you can change here. So if you're left handed, uh, you can change the primary button to be right. There are a bunch of keyboard shortcuts over here. There's printers you can add. Uh, there's a ton and a ton of customizability in Ubuntu. And besides that, we can also uh we can go over to the ubuntu software center over here and if we just click the search over here we can actually type in tweaks and tweaks well i've already installed it but you'll just be able to uh let's just quickly remove it over here we can click install over here and what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to do even more things so we can actually type in tweaks and in tweaks we have even more customizability options things that are not available to the normal settings menu and this is actually just the set this is actually just the tweaks menu for our desktop environment and pretty much what a desktop environment is is it's just a layer above your linux installation which just allows you to run a graphical user interface so if you're wondering the best definition to describe a desktop environment is it's just the graphical user interface or the GUI for Linux. Okay, so I think that we are done with setting up our desktop environment. Uh, again, if you want to play around with it a little bit, be my guest. Uh, but we're going to be moving on to console, to working in the console right away. And really because, like I said, we're not going to be doing too much in the GUI, right? So in the GUI, most system admins, most programmers, most people who are using Linux, they just use it to, you know, go onto the internet or maybe check their emails or maybe just write a letter. But we're not really going to be doing any system settings in here because it's just so limited and also to be honest with you it's not the best way to do it because it doesn't give you full control over everything you did okay that's enough mumbling for me we're gonna go over to the next section and in the next section we're gonna be doing some more console commands okay so now we're actually getting to the fun part and that's actually working in the terminal now how do we open the terminal well the terminal is actually right over here when we go over to activities we can type in terminal over here and that will open up our terminal but this is not the ideal way to open up your terminal there is something called a shortcut key and the shortcut key for opening your terminal is Control alt t 
and this will actually open up our terminal and this is basically what you will be doing when you open up the terminal you'll basically just do Control alt and that will open up the terminal now we are in the terminal here and we can see immediately that uh, we are working on this username and then the add means the computer that we're working on so this over here right away we can see this is our username and then followed by the add symbol and then it says our computer name right followed by a colon and this is the working directory so this is the directory we're currently working in and followed by the uh, dollar sign and the dollar sign actually stands for the shell this is actually the sign where the shell starts this is basically just the shell prompt and this is where we can actually start typing commands right so uh, let's see here so what is this tilt key so you need to know something about the tilt key and the tilt key is the shortcut symbol to the home directory so if we we would do pwd which means print working directory so this will print out our working directory we'll see that we are in the slash home slash herbert uh, folder and this means that we are working in the home directory so this forward slash means our root directory and from our root directory we are going into home and then we're going into our user directory so we're going to get into how uh, the file system works later in the course but just for now just uh, remember that we are working in our home directory and the home directory is situated in the slash home slash username in our case herbert and that the tilt key is actually a symbol that stands for this directory so just to give you an example we can actually change our directories as well so we can do cd slash home for example and this will bring us into the home directory and you'll see that it changes over here so in blue over here we'll see that our directory has changed to home instead of the tilt key and so now we can do ls and so ls will list all of the directories in our current folder and we can see that folder herbert is there and if we would do cd herbert again there we are again this is our tilt key because the terminal knows that we're working in the home directory and so it will always show this tilt key instead of the complete directory now we can get rid of all of this clutter and we can do clear and this gives us a nice uh, clean slate okay so these are your first terminal commands but we're going to get into them a little bit later because this is just you know, this is just scratching the surface so now we can actually go into the settings of our terminal so by default our terminal looks like this but we can make it look a little bit different now some of you guys might had a little bit, a bit of difficulty reading what i was typing in so we're going to get into the menu over here and we're going to go into preferences and we're going to change a few things now in general you can change a few things over here you can change the theme and you can actually change the theme to a light theme or to a dark theme over here you can choose whether you want to open the new terminals in window or in a tab uh, and also the new tab position can be last or next whatever you prefer over here we have some shortcuts you can have a look at these the shortcuts will actually help you uh, very much like for example editing stuff you want to copy stuff you want to paste stuff uh, that's all going to be very handy in the future but we're going to be focusing on the profiles and we have one profile called unnamed over here um, i do believe that we can rename it to something else so let's call it let's call it herbert for in this case because yeah that's my name and the first thing we can change is we're going to change some fonts. So let me drag this over here. Let's grab, drag this over here. So we can change the fonts over here. So if we enable this, uh, we'll see that it's immediately changed to a bigger font. And you'll see that the screen also increases in size. So the cursor, we can also change that. We can do a I-beam, which is actually uh, more of just a straight bar, a vertical bar, or we can do an underline which is more like a like an underscore cursor blinking we can disable that as well so that it doesn't blink so it just stands there or we can enable it and then it blinks whenever we are uh, ready to type something also we can enable sounds in the terminal by just enabling this icon over here and over here we can change some colors you know this is actually the the fun part because now we can actually make our because now 
This is actually a fun part because here we can actually make our terminal look like one of those matrix style things, right? So we can actually disable the default theme and now we actually have this matrixy style of a terminal and this is actually, you know, it's pretty cool to be working in in a matrixy style. So we can actually start typing stuff over here. When we do PWD, we see everything in green. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool, right? But again, you can play around with this a little bit, tweak it to your liking. If you like the default, just leave it at default. Uh, but we're just gonna we're not gonna play around with it too much. We're gonna leave it at default. But if you want to follow along with the tutorial and you want to play around with your themes and things like that, so be my guest. It's it's really something I do personally. But we're just gonna leave it at default for this tutorial. Over here, we can also change scrolling, although you shouldn't be messing around with this too much unless you actually need it for something. Let's say you have a text file or let's say a big log file. You can scroll up further than usual if you would just tweak these settings over here. Command and compatibility, I wouldn't touch on that too much. Uh, this is really a little bit more advanced stuff, so we're not going to be touching on that. Okay, so we're set up. We are in the terminal. We made it a little bit bigger so it's easier to read for you guys and i would suggest we just go to our next segment and we actually start typing some commands in here now we have been installing software through two mediums so we have been using the ubuntu software center and we've also been downloading google chrome from the internet using the dot dev package but the best way to update and install software is by using something called a package manager and in ubuntu the package manager is called apt apt and basically what this will do is it will allow you to download software install software and also keep it up to date so let's f first of all start with updating the software on our computer so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we know which pieces of software we need to update so we need to ask apt to grab a list of software on our computer that is not up to date and what apt will actually do is it will compare our software with the ones on the repositories now the repositories are a list of software on the servers from ubuntu and there are many other repositories out there but by default ubuntu's repository are just the ones that ubuntu provides right so you can add repositories to your repository list later on but that's beyond the scope of this course but we're going to be installing software from the ubuntu repositories and so by default uh, ubuntu has a lot of software installed and packaged now the upside of packaging is that we don't need to install all of the dependencies it's all taken care of by the package manager now there is one downside to having a package manager instead of actually downloading the latest version from the software manufacturer's website uh, and that is that the software manufacturer most likely has later versions because it takes a while for the package manager to actually implement that software but in most cases it doesn't really make a huge difference uh, you're most likely going to miss out on a few features uh, that are not included but most likely if you are that much of a power user you're not really using the package manager so much you're probably just either building your own packages from source or maybe you are just downloading the latest packages from the manufacturer of the software's website anyway that's again that's all beyond the scope of this video i want to make this easy for you guys and the easiest way to install software is by using a package manager and even though we don't get the latest latest cutting edge technology the software on here is always kept up to date so you're always going to get a fully functioning and a pretty stable and functioning and pretty up-to-date uh, version of the software anyway so first of all we need to make sure that we have administrative privileges now administrative privileges are granted to super users now by default your user on ubuntu is a super user if you install ubuntu the first user you create is always going to be a super user and that super user has the right to actually perform tasks like update the machine and access system files and install software which is what we are going to do so the way you actually tell the computer or the way you actually tell the terminal to 
perform a task as a super user or as a system administrator, as we would call it in Windows. If you want to have some sort of analogy between Windows and Linux, well, in Linux, we would call a super user what we would call in Windows an administrator, right? So what we would call an administrator in Windows, we would call a super user in Linux. They have elevated privileges on the machine. So let's now use our super user privileges to look for updates, to actually compare our software with the software on the repository side and see if there are differences, right? So let's do sudo apt, and apt is the name of the program that is the software manager or the package manager of Ubuntu. So sudo apt update, this will update our list of updatable software. Let's enter our password here. Oops, look like I looks like I made a little mistake here. There we go. And so now it's fetching the updates from the server and it says that there are 318 packages that can be upgraded. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Let's see what we can do. So actually, let's first of all see which uh, of these packages we can update. So we can actually do sudo apt list dash dash upgradable so that's actually what we can do also a good handy trick if you're typing a command in linux you can actually use the tab key to auto complete it often when there is no other solution uh when there is when you're typing in apt list dash dash and you type in upg for example if i would do upg and i do tab most likely it's going to think that i mean upgradable and if i press the tab key, it's going to autocomplete that and I don't have to type that whole word. Pretty little handy trick there. So let's press enter here. And now we get a list of all of the software that Ubuntu needs to update. So let's actually do that. So we're not going to go over the entire list, of course, but this gives you an idea of what uh, Ubuntu is actually going to update. So let's do sudo apt upgrade, which is going to perform the action of upgrading all the software that can be upgraded. So do so let's do sudo apt upgrade. It's going to ask us if we want to continue. We want to do the Y for yes and press enter. And this is going to take a while. So I'm going to pause the video now and I'm going to come back to you once the software is updated. So we've now updated everything on our machine. Uh, as you might have guessed, the default ISOs from the Ubuntu website don't have all up-to-date packages. Those are things that you have to do manually. You might have seen that Ubuntu asks you to update the packages using the software center. That's also a possibility, but I, I actually like to do it using the terminal like we just did. Now we have updated everything, uh, but like I said, this is all software that came pre-packaged. What if we want to install our own software? And that's the next thing we're going to do. So we can actually use that same tool, sudo apt, to install software as well. We have now updated software. We have looked for updates for any software that is installed on our machine, but we can also install our own software. And then that software will also be managed by the apt package manager. And so if there is a newer version of that software, apt will also add it to the list to compare it to the uh, versions on the repository. And if there's a later version, it will also install that version. So now let's think of something we want to install. Let's just say we want to install VLC media player. VLC media player is a media player that plays back video, pictures, and, and music. It's an all-around media player. We want to install it on our computer. Now, let's first of all see if that package that we actually want, VLC, let's see what the name of that package is, because as you might have guessed, there are going to be many type of packages with VLC in their name. It's not necessarily only our package that has VLC in its name. There might be multiple packages that have the name VLC, but we want to know which one we have to choose. So let's actually type in sudo apt search and then we're going to type in VLC. So now let's find VLC over here. Let's scroll up here and these are all plugins, plugins, bin, binaries. Oh, there we go. 
So we have VLC, multimedia player and streamer. That's the one we want, right? So it's just named VLC. So the name for the software package is always just in green. And then it says uh, which version it is. Let's scroll down here and now let's type in sudo apt install VLC. And it's going to ask us if we want to continue. We type the Y for yes. So now everything is installed. We can actually go over to activities and we can type in VLC. And we should see VLC popping up right over here. Click continue. And our media player has been installed. So that's how easy it is to install software. And if we want to remove it, we can actually just do sudo apt remove VLC. And we'll actually do the same thing. And this will actually remove that package from our uh, system. Now that's not everything. Like I said before, uh, all of those packages that came with VLC are still on our PC. So what we actually need to do is we need to type in sudo apt auto remove what this will do is actually look for all of the packages that are not linked to applications on our PC. So all of these applications that are installed here, we don't need those anymore because VLC is not installed and VLC is the software that needs all of these packages, right? So we're going to do yes. And now it's going to remove all of those libraries, all of those packages, and this should give us our disk space back. So there we are, all of those unnecessary packages are now removed from our system. So I'm going to round up this lecture with that said, and I'm going to move on to the next one where we're going to talk about the Linux file system. In this lecture, we are going to learn about the Linux file system. This is the most important part of learning Linux because everything in Linux is a file. To avoid confusion, from now on, I will be referring to folders as directories in Linux and just keep using the term folder when I'm talking about Windows. When we compare Linux with Windows, for example, we see a lot of other differences. First of all, Windows uses the NTFS file system, whereas Linux uses the ext4 or ext3 file system. I've made some sort of comparison between the two operating systems so you can see where the differences lie. First of all, you should know that there is no such thing as a drive letter in Linux. Windows, on the other hand, works purely with drive letters and each drive letter has its own file structure. In Linux, this is not the case. In Linux, we work with drives, partitions and mount points. The user can then choose where to mount these drives with the mount command. So in Linux, we don't have drive letters, but we do have directories which direct us to the drive we want to write to. In this diagram, you can see some of the most important directories you need to remember. In this course, we also won't be diving too deep into most of these directories, but it's handy to know them should you ever need them in the future. Let's go over some of them. We start off with the root directory, which we can access using the forward slash. Underneath this is a bunch of subdirectories, but I haven't added all of them in this diagram again because it might get a little bit confusing for you guys otherwise. If you are interested in the other directories too, you can have a look at this Wikipedia page which talks about the Unix file system. Like we talked about before, this is the forward slash bin directory where all of our binaries or executables are located. In the Etsy directory, you will find all of your configuration files. In the home directory, you'll find all of the user's home directories which contain the user documents and pictures for example. In the forward slash user forward slash bin directory, we can find the executables. But like we said before, the forward slash bin directory is a symlink or symbolic link to this directory. This means that anything that gets put into the forward slash bin directory will instead be added to the forward slash user forward slash bin directory. And if we try to open the forward slash bin directory, we will see the contents of the forward slash user forward slash bin directory. This does not mean that forward slash bin is a copy. It's more like a shortcut towards the forward slash user forward slash bin directory. We then have the forward slash dev directory, which contains all of the devices, but we are only going to focus on the hard disk devices in this course. And finally, the forward slash lib directory is where all our libraries are located. Like we said before, the libraries are the pieces of software needed to run other executables on the Linux machine. 
So now that we have that out of the way, we can start to actually navigate ourselves through the file system in the next lecture. Now we've explored the file system a little bit. Let's actually start with exploring some commands to navigate ourselves through the file system. So we have already done a few commands in the previous lectures. For example, we did pwd. And this will print our working directory. Remember, the working directory is also displayed over here. We already know that the tilde key means that we are working in our current user directory. So pwd by itself isn't really a very handy tool because you can actually see your current working directory right over here. Uh, but it is very handy to use in, in shell scripts, for example. Now we also looked at the cd command and the cd command means change directory. So we can actually change directories by typing in CD and then specifying which directory we want to change to. Now, besides that, there's also another command that we already saw, which is the LS command, which will list all of our uh, directories within our current working directory. And as you can see, there's a bunch over here. So maybe let's change into one of those directories. Let's change into our documents directory. And we can do that by typing in CD. Remember, uh, we can also, when we type in DOC, we see that there are no other directories in this directory that have DOC. So the only directory that has DOC as its first three letters is documents. So we can press the tab key and it will auto complete into documents. That way we don't need to type it all over again. So now we are in the documents directory. Let's see what's in here, right? Let's do another LS, nothing. Of course, there's nothing in here because it is a clean installation. Let's put something in here. And we're going to do that by typing in the touch command. Now, touch is a command that will just create a empty file. Uh, but again, it's nothing more than that. It's just an empty file. There's nothing in it. It's just an empty file. So we're just going to type in touch test file. And if we do an ls again, we'll see that our test file is now inside of this directory. Now, okay, we have a file now, but we also want to create a directory, right? Well, we can do that by typing in mkdir. And mkdir will create a directory. mkdir stands for make directory. So let's make a directory called testdir. Let's do another ls, and we should see that testdir is in blue, which means that it's a directory, and test file is in white, which means that it's a file. Now there are a lot of other colors, like a green color stands for a executable file, uh, but we're not going to get into mo too much detail just yet. We are going to cover file permissions in which we will cover things like um, executables. And we're also going to, and we're also going to create a sim link, uh, which also has a different color. But in this case, we're just going to go with whatever we have now. Now, let's just say I created this file and I want to copy that file into my test directory. Let's do that. So let's do cp test file. And let's type in test dir file. And if we don't add anything to it, uh, we should see in test dir that test file is in there. But we can also do something else. So we can do cp test file. And then we can say test dir forward slash test file two, for example, we don't, we can specify a different file name inside that directory. So let's do that. And let's do another LS test dir. Oops. And there we have it. We have two files in our test dir right now. Now this is what we call a relative path. We can also copy things to a absolute path. And the difference is a relative path is a path relative to our working directory, which means that in this case, the directory for test dir is just test dir. But if we are working from a absolute path, we have to type in the whole path. So let's do that. So let's type in cp test file. And now we can type in slash ohm slash Herbert. Remember, our working directory was slash home slash Herbert. And now we are working in documents. So we can see that the tilt key means that we are working in our 
home user directory and we are also working in documents. So that's how we know that this is actually our current uh, working directory. And then we can type in documents and now we can specify something else. So we can do maybe test file three. And now let's do another LS. So look what we did here. We specified the absolute path, which starts, which starts from the root directory, then goes into our home directory, then goes into our user directory, then goes into our documents, and then finally it will copy it to the test file three. Now let's do one more thing with our relative path. So let's go into our test tier. So let's do CD test tier. And now we are inside our test directory and we can do an ls again and we can see that our test file and test file 2 are in this directory now what we want to do here is we want to copy a file from this directory to the upper lying directory so the, the 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 directory above it so we want to copy from test from test there to documents so we could do that in this way right so we could do uh, cp test file now we can specify the whole absolute path, Herbert, and then documents, and then we can specify um, we can specify test file four. Right. So let's go back, and we can do we can go back by typing in cd dot dot, and we're gonna need those two dots in just a second here. So let's do another ls and we can see that our test file 4 has been copied to our documents directory. Now let's go back into our test directory. So we can do this a lot easier. Remember what we did here? So we did cp test file and then we specified the whole absolute path. Well, absol actually, well actually we can do it a lot easier. We can just type in dot dot forward slash and then test file 5 for example. And this will actually If we go one up, this will actually do the same. So we can actually specify the dot dot symbol or that dot or two dots. So we can actually specify two dots to take us up one directory above the current working directory. So we've been doing a lot of copying, but we also want to be able to move stuff, right? So let's move a couple of files. So let's do MV test file three. And let's move that over to our test dir. Let's put that into test file seven. I think we're at seven or we're at six. Um, so let's go into test dir again. And we should see that test file six has been added. And now let's do another ls. And we should see that would you look at that test file three has been removed it's no longer here we only have test file test file four and test file five so those are the only test files that are remaining and that's because we moved it with the mv command now our setup is a little bit messy so let's do another ls here and we can see that we have a test dir, we have a test file test file four test file five that's pretty yeah that's that's a lot so let's try to clean that up a little bit so Let's try to do rm test file. Let's do another ls. There we go. Test file is gone. Now we want to remove that test dir as well. Watch what happens. rm test dir. And it says cannot remove test dir is a directory. That's because we have to specify an argument. And we have to tell it that it has to remove everything recursively. And we do that by specifying rm minus r. It will actually remove the directory and all of its contents by specifying the minus r. So if we do ls again, we should see that our test dir folder is now gone. And if we would do something like rm star, this will actually remove everything in this directory. So as you can see, ls shows us nothing is still in this directory. Now that we've seen how we can actually create files, create directories, copy files, all of that stuff, it's time for us to actually start writing some files with a text editor. Now that we have basic file navigation out of the way, we are going to have a look at file editors or text editors. 
So there are two main file editors or two main text editors, whatever you want to call them. And they're Nano and Vim. Nano is actually the simplified version of Vim a little bit. So it's actually more of a simple text editor, whereas Vim is going to be a little bit more complicated uh, as well in usage as in whatever you can do with it. That's my personal opinion. Some people find Vim a lot easier to use. Uh, but again, your opinion might differ as well. So that's all up to you. But we're going to start off with Nano. So Nano is actually like the basic file editor, the basic text editor. And you can sort of compare it with Notepad. So we're going to, first of all, we can actually create files in two ways, right? So we can touch a file and we can create a new file and then we can edit that file. So if we're going to use touch and we create a new file, then we can edit that file with the text editor. But we don't have to do that. So we can actually do touch testfile.txt, for example, and then we can do nano testfile.txt and this will open up our text file. But we don't have to do that. We can actually just specify nano test file to txt, which is a file that doesn't exist. And then we'll see that nano says it's a new file. Now we can actually start typing stuff in here. So we can do test file is the best file. I don't know. Probably isn't, but anyway, let's go with it. Uh, now we have to save this. So we're going to do control O file name to write it's going to ask us which file name we want to write to and by default it's going to ask us the file name we specified in the command line and we can just do enter or we can change the name if we want to there we go we wrote one line now we can actually also just instead of typing uh, text we can also do Control k which will cut our text away and then we can do Control u to paste it and then we can paste it multiple times we can do Control o again we can enter and then we can exit out of here uh, by doing control X. There we go. Now there's a bunch more. Uh, there's a bunch more shortcuts for nano and you can do control G to view them. Now we're not going to get into all of the shortcuts because it's, you know, it's going to get quite lengthy. So it's better off. You just go through this by yourself. This is something that you should be learning in Linux is to help yourself. Using manuals is one of the first things you should do. And also there's a there's a lot of information out there. And the next editor we are talking about is Vim. Vim is a little bit more difficult than Nano. And I would say that it's definitely not for the beginning user. Um, I would say that it's important to know that you don't have to learn Vim really. Nowadays, most text can just be edited straight out of uh, a text editor like Visual Studio Code, especially if you're working on servers that support SSH, uh, you can just log into that server and you can actually just use like an SSH plugin for VS Code. But I would suggest you just play around with it a little bit because there might be times that you actually need to use it and you know, you never know when you might encounter this. But in my personal opinion, I haven't used Vim in years. I generally use Nano and that gets me around. Uh, Nano is also has been updated lately that it also supports like colorization. And you can also see like if you're having, a, if you have a config file that has certain colors and color schemes uh, and also some sort of formatting, uh, Nano supports that as well. And I think it's just easier to use the arrow keys, but some people, and most likely these people are going to be more veteran uh, developers or more veteran uh, Linux uh, system administrators. They swear by Vim because it's just, you know, it's just, a, it's just how you learn to work with Vim. You know, Vim does have its uh, upsides, you know, all these shortcuts, they can make it very easy to navigate yourself through text. And yeah, that it's this, this is not something that's impossible with other text editors, but it is one of the most advanced text editors that you can find in a terminal. So to use Vim, we actually have to so to use Vim, we type in vi, which is the command to open Vim. And then we type in our uh, file name and we do test file vim.txt, for example. And this will open up Vim. So we've opened up Vim now and we can actually start typing stuff here. So we can do i to insert text and or we can do a to append text. So depending on where your cursor is, so we can do, we can type something here. We can do i 
this is a sentence. Then we can do escape and we can do colon W to write our text. We can also do I, which will insert text in front of our word. So we can do something like that. So we can actually, you'll see that we have actually typed the word. So we, we have actually inserted our characters before our cursor. And we can do the A, and this will start typing after the cursor. So that's actually appending. We can also copy things, and we call this yank by doing Y twice. And then we can actually start typing again. We can go to the next line. And we can do P to, we can do P, and this will paste our text. Now we can also do a double D, so DD will delete text or cut it. There we go. And then when we press P again, our cut text appears again. Again, this is something that you have to practice yourself on a daily basis. This is the very, very basics of Vim. Uh, again, I am not planning on going to on going very deep into Vim in this tutorial, just because I don't think it is so important anymore. Uh, it used to be very, very important. People really emphasized Vim in uh, a lot of Linux tutorials, but nowadays we have so many other tools, so much more modern tools than having to edit in a uh, than having to edit in a console text editor. So I would say I would suggest you just learn Nano, and you would actually just use something like VS Code to edit files on servers. If you're actually, if you're ever going to use a server, I would highly suggest you would just install something like Visual Studio Code and uh, installing extensions that, and installing extensions that allow for SSH connections. Okay, that's enough for now. That's enough for the text editors. Let's move on to the next um, lecture where we're going to talk about file ownership and file permissions. Now in Linux, there's a lot of commands and this course is more aimed uh, to get to know Linux as fast as possible. So if I would go over every command, that would be, you know, that would be, I would be talking for hours and hours and hours on end. And you don't want that, right? You want to get going with Linux as fast as possible. Those commands, they will come in time. And if you find a command that is useful to you, but you don't know how it works, there's always a good way to find help for it. So for example, let's just say I want to know more about the ls command. The ls command is the command we use to get a list of all of the uh, directories and all of the files in the current working directory. So let's do, let's just see how we can get some help here, right? So we can do man, which stands for manual, then we can type in ls. And this will give us a document that talks about all of the possible, um, all of the possible arguments you can give. And so you can read through this document and see uh, if you can find the argument you're looking for. Or you can also do ls dash dash help, for example. This would also be a good way to find uh, help. And this will actually most likely just display the uh, help page or the man page in a printed format over here. So these are two ways to actually get help. And most commands have either a man page or they have um, a dash dash help uh, argument. Or you could also go to kernel.org or there's many other uh, man pages out there where you can find help. And most likely you're not going to be doing this, right? You're just going to be typing in whatever you want to find on Google and you'll go from there. Now you have to watch out a little bit where you're looking because sometimes um, on some forums, people might give answers that aren't really correct. So I would go to either Stack Overflow and maybe even Reddit would be a good place to search because over there, there are multiple users who can verify that answer. So if I would go over to Stack Overflow now, if I would go over to Stack Overflow and I don't know, I would find something uh, Linux LS. I would just type in something like that to tell that I'm a human. They will always uh, vote up, upvote something. So if I would go over here, the answers will be upvoted. And sometimes uh, when the answer is green, it will tell you that this is actually the solution to that problem. 
So it, it, it so it's much better at actually telling you whether or not that answer answer is actually valid or not. So I would suggest you go and get help from the internet or just by typing in the man uh, just by using the man pages. So yeah, there are multiple options and. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, most likely I'll be searching on Stack Overflow if I don't know something. Um, it's no shame to just use Stack Overflow for pretty much everything. Uh, a lot of people do it. Some people actually just don't really remember how to fix problems because they fix so many problems every single day. Um, it's no shame to have to search every time. So uh, yeah, just get to know Stack Overflow a little bit, get to know uh, how to search on Google, but also don't forget that there are man pages out there. So sometimes it's better to actually search it yourself so you can remember it later and it makes you a little bit more independent uh, and I'll always have to, so you don't have to always have to depend on Stack Overflow. So we're going to learn about one more thing and that's called piping and piping is actually very important. No, it has nothing to do with plumbing. Don't worry. It has everything to do, however, with passing commands onto other commands or passing commands through to an output, for example. So we're now in our home directory and let's just say we are looking for our documents directory. I know we can find it by typing ls and there it is, but let's just say that this is a massive a massive massive directory and we are looking for our uh, documents directory we can do that by typing in find documents for example and this will show us where uh, our documents are and we can see that it's you know in this same folder right but we can also do something like this so we can do ls and this will show us of course our documents directory but we could also do something like ls and we can pipe that through to a grep command and a grep command is a sort of a filter so it will filter through our output and then it will grab whatever we need so we can do grep documents and it will also display that here is documents uh, but we can also do something like doc and it will also tell us that there is this one this one uh, directory in here that starts with DOC, which is documents, right? This is one example of uh, cat. Uh, this is one example of piping commands through to other commands. Next, we can do something like, for example, ls, and we can pipe that through to a file, so a text file, for example. So we know that ls, the output is this over here, so we can pipe that through to uh, output txt for example and if we do cat output.txt cat will display whatever is in that uh, file and we can see that our ls so the directory the output of the directory listing is in that output.txt file but we can actually combine these as well so we can do something like echo which by itself does something like this so echo hello world will display hello world in the console we can also do something like this so we can do echo hello world and then we can pipe that through to cat and then we can tell cat to put that output into output.txt and if we do cat output.txt now we'll see that hello world has been appended at the end of our text. Now this is also something that you have to practice a little bit and of course all these commands that I used in here uh, some of them are new we haven't talked about echo we haven't talked about cat and there are many many commands out there that you'll be using whenever you need to do something and that's really the beauty of Linux is you'll learn all of these commands you know you'll learn them uh, at the end of the day uh, but for example, I rarely use the cat command. I, I'm much more comfortable with nano because I can scroll through the file much more easily. And also it doesn't clutter my entire terminal when I output some text file using cat because that's not really handy. You could use something like tail output.txt and that will just display the uh, last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, out, um, entries for example or you can do head output the txt which will do the opposite it will display the first 10 so you can play around with a lot of commands but again if i'm going to go into every single command that is available to linux this this tutorial will lose its purpose of being short and you know quick and getting you up to speed as fast as possible because that's not what 
Linux is about, right? It's not about knowing all of these commands off the top of your head. There's plenty of uh, forums out there that can help you with that. And that's how you should be learning Linux. And by the time you have practiced a little bit with Linux, you will be uh, knowing some of these commands at the top of your head, and that's how you will actually actually grow. But you'll have to be using Linux on a daily basis. That's what I'm really, that's why I really want you guys to know the basics and the rest will come, you know, know the basics, start using the basics. And whenever there's something you don't know, you go on Google, you search for it, and you'll find about it. So yeah, now we're going to go over to the next lecture, which is about shell variables. When we're running commands in the command line, it can become very easy to think that every single command you have to type is going to get so very long. There's going to be so many arguments and you always have to type it over and over and over again. Well, you can actually mitigate that a little bit by uh, using something called variables. And there's two types of variables. There's the regular environmental variables we use, but there's also something called a, an alias. Uh, let's first of all look at what an alias is. So an alias is actually a replacement for a command. So we can actually specify a command and or we can specify a word or whatever we, or, or whatever term we want to use. And that will actually substitute as another command. Let me show you how that's done. So let's just say we want to find our username, right? So we can do something like echo and then we can do echo uh, dollar sign user, uh, which is the symbol. So dollar sign uh, before a word is the symbol of a variable. So we can do echo dollar sign user and then the user variable will be called so we can get our username, right? Well, we don't we don't always want to type in echo space user uh we just want to do something else so we can do maybe alias uh show user equals and then we can do the quotation marks with one quote and then we're going to do show user equals echo dollar sign user and then we'll close our quotation marks and this now has exported the alias show user as the command uh, echo dollar sign user so if i were to show user now we would get the echo dollar sign user so that's how we actually work with aliases so we have to know one more thing about these variables and that is that you know we used a built-in system variable here so this is by default built in but we can make our own uh variables as well so we can do something like export we'll name this linux course oops linux course equals and then we have to do the same thing over here we have to uh, encapsulate that into two quotes because we're going to make this a string linux course equals for beginners and then we do enter and if we would do something like echo dollar sign Linux course, you would get that string uh, in that uh, variable. So that variable has been exported to that string. But what happens when I close my terminal and I open it up again? So if I would do something like echo dollar sign Linux course, nothing happens. And that's because these variables are Linux doesn't keep track of these. They he just Linux just uses them in this current terminal session. If we close our terminal session, they're gone. So we can actually make this permanent by going into something that we call our bash RC file or our profile, our bash profile. And we can access it by doing nano. First of all, let's do uh, ls minus uh, a. This will show us everything and we can see our dot bash RC over here. So that's what we want. So we want nano dot bash RC, which is, oops, dot bash rc which is the file that we're going to edit now so in the bash rc file we can do loads of stuff over here and you can see that there's already a bunch of uh variables being assigned here so we have hist size hist file size we have um some let me see over here we have another one ps1 we have aliases assigned and we can make our own over here. So we can do just the same as we just did. So let's do the same. So let's do alias um, show username. We'll just do the same. So show username uh, equals and then single quote echo user and close our single quotes. 
and let's do another one let's do our export as well so we can do linux course so remember we don't need to type in the export command we can just type in our variable and then we just have to do the equal sign and uh, linux equals beginner course or something like that and now we can save it by doing control o remember control o to save stuff in um, nano that we can exit out of here and now we have to do one more thing we have to type in source dot bash rc and now we can actually close up because it will remember it if we open it up again we can do we can do show username and this works but for some reason linux course didn't work let's see why Oh, we just did Linux. Yeah, we have to make it Linux course, of course. So we have to save that, and then we're gonna have to do another source bash rc. Oops, source dot bash rc. You can see how easy it is to make mistakes when you're typing stuff in the terminal. Let's close that up. Let's do control T again. Let's do echo Linux course. And then we get beginner course and we're gonna we can do show username and this will sort of show us our username so that's pretty much how variables work and this is something that you're going to be using a lot when you're working with bash scripts so now we're going to be installing visual studio code um, we're going to be downloading it from the website but we're not going to be using the software center this time we're going to be installing it using a packaging tool called tpkg so let's go over to the mozilla firefox web browser here and let's open up code.visualstudio.com make sure you download the .dep package here and then save it and then wait for it to complete and then we'll open up our downloads folder so you should have your downloads folder opened over here and what we're going to do is we're going to right click inside that folder and we're going to do open in terminal now you could also do something if you are in the terminal and you are in your um home directory then you could also do something like cd downloads and this is bringing you to the same um to that same full to that same directory okay so we have two um all right so we have well this is another one this is a copy i downloaded but i'm gonna just gonna use this one over here so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing sudo dpkg and then we're going to be copying this one over here. So we're going to be selecting it and then we're going to do copy and then paste that over here. And actually we have to specify dpkg minus I to tell it to install something. And this is actually the command that we're going to be running. So sudo uh, dpkg minus I and then the dot deb package. And this is going to ask us for our password. It's unpacking the code and this will probably take a while before it starts actually installing setting up code there we go and our command has run we can exit now we can close this up we can close this up and we should be able to find code when we type it in there we go visual studio code and we can also right click and add this to our favorites and then it will be always pinned over here whenever we need it there we go and now we're going to be setting up uh, a Visual Studio Code. So we want to open a folder over here. And let's create a new uh, folder here. And let's name it. Um, let's name it. Let's name it Bash Scripts. There we go. And now we have our bash scripts folder opened over here and now we're going to do one more thing we're going to be installing the extension for bash so we're going to go over to the extensions and then we can do bash debug just to have something that can help us debug and by default you don't need this extension but it is quite handy to have it uh, it helps you with debugging your code so in the next lecture we're going to look at how to actually write scripts in visual studio code well now we are working in our visual studio code editor and we are going to write our first shell script so there's a few things we're going to need to do first 
we are going to open our terminal window in Visual Studio Code. This will make it a lot easier. And you can do that by typing, uh, by clicking on terminal and then uh, clicking on new terminal. And this will open up our bash terminal uh, down here. It's gonna make it very easy to run our code later and also to run some commands. It's a lot easier to just use Visual Studio Code for that. And this makes this makes it so that we don't always have to switch between uh, our terminal and then back to Visual Studio Code. This allows us to just have a console. This allows us to just have a terminal inside Visual Studio Code. So now let's create the file we actually need. So we're going to click on New File. And we're going to name this. Um, we're going to make a um, shell script that prints the date to that prints the current date and time to a file that's all we're gonna do because we didn't learn like very advanced stuff in this course you know we're just gonna do a few things that gets you up to speed so what we're gonna do is time print dot sh and dot sh is the uh, extension for bash scripts so in order to tell uh, linux that this is a shell script we need to tell it that it, it needs to use the bash interpreter and we can do that by doing the shebang like we call it so uh, it's actually a, a hashtag and then a exclamation mark forward slash bin forward slash bash and this will actually uh, tell linux that this is a bash script all right so we have written our first line of shell script now the next thing we want to do is we want to tell it to create a file because we want to write something to the we want to write the date and the time to a file right so that's what we're going to do now so we're going to do touch uh, time file dot txt you can also call it date file but i'm just going to call it time file it doesn't really matter that much because it's just for demonstration purposes now we want to make sure that this keeps running all the time, right? So we don't want it to stop unless we tell it to. So how do we do that? So there's something called a while loop and a while loop will tell your script that it needs to keep running until you tell it to stop. So, or until a certain condition is met. But if, if we're not going to tell it to, if we're gonna, not going to give it any condition to stop, it's just going to keep running until we tell it to stop. So we can do that by doing while true. And then we're going to do a follow-up command by doing the uh, semicolon. And then we're going to say do. And then we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to call the command date. And if you, if you might remember, if you just do date, we just get the, uh, the date here and the time and the time zone as well. So we want to pipe that through to our cat command, and then we want to concatenate that to our time file.txt. That's what we're going to do here. Then we want to make sure that uh, we can also maybe, well, also we can maybe tell the file that we wait for maybe five seconds, let's say. So what we're going to do echo uh, waiting for five seconds maybe something like that and then we need to make sure that we actually wait for five seconds and that's by doing sleep five so we type in sleep five and sleep is the command that tells a script to wait for a number of seconds and sleep is always defined in seconds so if you want like a minute you have to do 60 if you want an hour you have to do uh, 3600 seconds and i think then we just type done because if we do something, we have to tell it when it's done. So, and then we can do control S to save it. Now let's see here, we have time print.sh, but we need to make the file also executable because if I would do just something like time print.sh, it's gonna tell us that the command isn't, uh, the, the command is, the per permission is denied to execute that command. So we have to tell Linux that we are allowing this file to be executed and we can do that by doing chmod and chmod is actually um, a way of telling pe of telling a file that it has a certain permission and there are more uh, permissions that you can tell a file to have and it can also do that with groups and users but this is actually more 
aimed towards server administration, whereas this is more aimed towards, you know, just getting to know Linux a little bit. Uh, but we're just going to go with chmod plus x, and this is going to give us the plus x, the, this is going to give us the executable uh, permission. All right, we have to, of course, specify which file we we want to change. So we don't want to do chmod plus x, and then we have to enter the file. And if we do ls now, we'll see that timeprint.sh is green, which means that it's an executable. And if we do timeprint.sh right now, it's going to tell us, waiting for five seconds, we can actually go into timefile.txt, and we'll see that this is actually every five seconds it's adding some date and some time to our text file and if we do control C we can stop our bash script from running and if you run it again it will just start where it stopped and it will start counting the five seconds again as you can see we always have five seconds and it just keeps counting.